um, our last, but certainly not least, talk um, is by Dr. Yan Wu uh, from the lab of Kun Zhang at the Autos uh, Labs. So the Zhang lab was recently uh, moved from UCSD to Autos Labs. Um, Dr. Zhang had a personal um, issue to deal with. So uh, I want to thank Dr. Yan Wu for stepping up to give us this presentation. The Zhang lab has been really, really um, productive in genomics and epigenomics and single cell analysis. Um, so Dr. Wu today will present uh, IPS cell uh, induced teratomas. Uh, so instead of us busy in differentiating IPS cells, they let the mice do the work. Uh, his title, I think the title is still multi-lineage modeling and manipulation of human development. Dr. Wu. Hi, yes. Thank you for the kind introduction, and I will go ahead and share. Okay, is everyone seeing the right screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So yes, unfortunately, um, Kun couldn't be here today. So I'll I'm going to be talking about um, the teratoma as a multi lineage model of human development um, in his stead. Um, just some quick acknowledgements. Um, so Daniela was um, the um, lab member in um, my uh, lab mate in Prashant's lab who kind of worked on the experimental side of things. Um, and then obviously Kun and Prashant were the um, co-corresponding authors um, on this study. And it was funded by the um, NHGRI uh, R01. So developmental models are key to understanding um, human-specific development, I think, as everyone in this conference uh, most likely knows. And there, there are a couple of different ways to go about it, including animal models and different types of stem cell models more recently. Um, and one issue with animal models is there are um, fundamental biological differences, especially in um, the neuroectoderm area. For example, in this um, single cell study, they mapped orthologous mouse human cell types and they found that um, quite a few uh, there are quite a few differentially expressed genes there are quite a few genes that diverge in at least one um, brain cell type 2d culture often fails to produce mature cell types um, one example here is these um, hepatocytes grown in 2d versus 3d culture the 3d hepatocytes have greater hepatocyte identity and organoids um, <clears throat> including the talk right before me, um, they offer a 3D model of development, um, which is really interesting. But um, many of the genes um, in have effects across multiple lineages, for example. Um, and even during um, development, the same gene will have different effects right across um, different lineages and at different stages of development. Um, and one example here is RENX1, which is involved in both muscle regeneration neuronal development, and um, is a tumor suppressor in the um, gut. So teratomas were an interesting model for us because they contain 3D vascularized human tissue from all lineages. Um, and they're primarily used um, as the sort of gold standard for um, stem cell pluripotency. So the teratoma formation assay was something that was done to validate whether stem cells could were truly pluripotent. And they also, and to validate that they are truly pluripotent, you have to validate that they contain um, organized tissue structures from all germ layers. So here we see ectoderm, endoderm, and mesodermal um, histology stains. Um, and for the endoderm, you can zoom in on one of these little uh, sort of structures that looks like an intestinal epithelium. Another advantage of teratomas is because they can model multiple cell types and cell lineages, um, they enable multi-lineage human-specific genetic screens. Um, they enable us to do perturbations at a large scale um, across multiple cell types and across multiple um, sort of tissue types as well. Now, the teratoma was very difficult to characterize because everything was sort of in a semi-organized state. 
until single cell technologies came along. And they were really unlocked the ability for us to um, profile these teratomas um, and characterize the cell types essentially by not having to deal with, by being able to, to dissect the heterogeneity um, at throughput. So we initially characterized cell types across seven teratomas. Um, so by um, kind of uh, in creating teratomas by mixing a one-to-one -one ratio of matrigil um, and stem cells in M teaser, injecting them into the flank of a not skid mouse. Um, we would let the teratomas grow from for about eight to 10 weeks, um, excise them and dissociate them into single cell suspension for single cell RNA sequencing. After correcting for technical batch effects, we found more than 20 cell types across all germ layers. Um, and this includes, and sorry, this is a UMAP plot of the seven teratomas generated from the H1 stem cell line. Um, and we see, um, again, all three germ layers, endoderm, ectoderm, um, mesoderm, and the most um, abundant cell type are um, mesenchymal stem cells um, or fibroblasts. Um, this fibroblast kind of like uh, cell state that we notice, but we do see other um, cell types such as gut um, and these neuroectoderm cell types, um, such as radioglia, early neurons, um, and a population of cells that look like cycling progenitors. So we validated these cell types using histology, and this was done by um, Dr. Ann Tips, um, a pathologist uh, at UCSD. Um, you can see H and E staining kind of validating um, many of the cell types that we observed with uh, single cell RNA seq, and we validated a handful of cell types, um, specifically um, radial glia, early neurons, area epithelium, cardiac muscle, intestinal epithelium, and um, mesenchyme using RNA fish markers. So one question about um, the teratomas is how heterogeneous are they? Because the differentiation in a teratoma is sort of semi-structured, it's fairly unorganized um, compared to maybe something like an organoid or normal human development, there's a question of whether the teratomas would be extremely variable in their cell type composition. So we kind of looked into the mixing um, of teratomas and we found essentially that the heterogeneity between teratomas from the same cell line, um, from the H1 line, was similar to the heterogeneity between um, the pattern brain organoids um, kind of generated from uh, generating the literature. And one note was that teratomas from different cell lines um, had much higher heterogeneity. They had um, kind of lower entropy. So uh, a higher kind of score on this entropy metric means better mixing um, and less heterogeneity, and the lower score means actually more heterogeneity. So we also um, compared the teratoma cell types against fetal human cell types um, to kind of benchmark their approximate age, and we can see that actually the different um, cell types seem to mature at different rates. So the um, teratoma neuroectoderm seems to correlate strongest with the um, fetal week 13 through week 17 um, cell types, and whereas the gut correlates strongest with um, week eight cell types. We also validated that um, Neuro, teratoma neural cell types project onto fetal human um, embeddings of those fetal cell types. So on the top, we have a fetal cortex um, projection of this um, single cell data, um, or sorry, embedding of the single cell data. And then we project the cortical teratoma cell types onto the same embedding. And we can see that the match cell types project into approximately the same kind of spatial areas, which is what we're looking for. And then we also see that the um, teratoma neural cell types express similar marker genes as fetal human cell types. For example, radial glia express VIM, 
um, early neurons express DCX, um, interneurons express TLX1, and cycling progenitors express um, cycling genes such as HMGB2. And we kind of repeated the same analysis for teratoma gut cell types, where we can see that they, the mid and hind gut versus the foregut project onto similar spatial locations and that they express similar um, key marker genes. So next, we look to do a CRISPR screen in teratomas, where we essentially did two separate replicate screens with three teratomas each. Um, and the way this worked was we packaged a CRISPR library into um, a lentivirus library, transduced um, PGP1 Cas9 iPSCs with this um, library, and then injected these mosaic, these iPSCs into the mouse to generate teratomas to create sort of these mosaic teratomas with um, 20 different, or sorry, um, yes, about 24 different um, genotypes. We knocked out 24 key embryonic um, regulators that were known to be um, embryonic lethal in mouse. We then used our single cell RNA-seq pipeline to look at shifts in cell type abundance that resulted um, due to gene knockout. So we're looking at sort of the, the shift in cell proportion um, between the non-targeting controls and the knockout. And the goal was to identify developmental lineages that were regulated by these knockout genes. Um, that were consistent across both replicate screens. So uh, just really quickly, um, we did kind of two types of analysis. One analysis measured the overall effect of gene knockouts, and one analysis measuring the effect of knockouts on individual cell types. And um, as a result, we sort of um, plotted the knockouts by their overall effect size, um, on the y-axis and the reproducibility in terms of which cell types they're affecting um, on the x-axis. And we see uh, overall correlation between um, effect size and reproducibility, which is um, sort of what we're looking for. Um, and then we kind of looked at the, the top um, knockouts that were the most reproducible and had the strongest effect size. I'm gonna talk here about twist one and run one knockouts in more depth. Um, and, and just, um, sorry, before that, uh, TWIST1 and RUNX1, um, if we kind of plot a heat map of the different uh, cell types um, that they're affecting, grouped by germ layer, we can see that a lot of these two knockouts have multi-lineage effects. They have um, effects across germ layers. So what we found with TWIST1 was that it depleted the mesoderm and enriched, or mesenchyme, sorry, um, and enriched for ectoderm. Um, so if we plot the effects um, on cell types across both um, the original screen and the replicate screen, um, we can see a, a depletion in mesenchymal stem cell and fibroblast-like cells, um, an increase in retinal epithelium and neurons. Um, and that's due to twist one's known role as a regulator of um, epithelial to mesenchymal transition, or EMT. Um, and specifically in this, in one study, they, they observed that um, uh, this EMT process is really important for neural crest progenitors. Um, and twist, knocking out twist one sort of um, alters the balance between um, mesoderm and, me mesen yeah, and mesenchyme um, versus neuroactoderm. So Runix, the RUNX1 knockout also impacted multiple germ layers. So we see here a decrease in muscle and an increase in mid and hinga epithelium, um, also a decrease in neural progenitors. And um, there have been multiple studies that have kind of shown um, that the RUNX1 is critical for neurocrest and myoblast formation. Um, and it's also a tumor suppressor in the gut epithelium. So Basically, knocking out RUNX1 uh, prevents myoblasts um, from proliferating and forming correctly. Um, knocking out RUNX1 prevents um, kind of uh, neural crest and neuroectoderm development. So we see this decrease in neural progenitors and muscle. And the increase in mid hydrogen epithelium is interesting because it's possible that this increase is due to its role, RUNX1's role as a tumor suppressor in the gut. So there may be. Um, cancerous cells, um, although we haven't followed up on that. 
We also wanted to look at teratoma as a model for single gene congenital disorders. So here, what we did was we knocked out genes responsible for L1, Rhett, and Pitt-Hopkins syndromes in these iPSCs. Again, generated um, these mosaic teratomas and looked at the shifts in gene expression um, within each cell type now. One thing we note is that if you look at the effects of these neural disease um, knockouts on cell type proportion, they're kind of overall less, um, less of an effect on cell type proportion than the embryonic lethal knockouts, which makes sense. The embryonic lethal knockouts seem to be essentially preventing the um, development of an entire cell type or an entire um, cell subtype. Whereas these neural disease, disease knockouts um, are much less kind of harsh. So that led us to kind of, instead of looking at shifts in cell state, um, to look at shifts in gene expression um, within cell types instead. And this is, we kind of use the pseudo-bulk analysis here to find reproducible shifts in gene expression um, across guide RNAs and across teratomas. And what we found was that um, L1 cam uh, knockout, so kind of trying to model L1 cam syndrome, um, resulted in a decrease of the expression of CLU, um, which is a chaperone protein implicated in um, neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's. And this link between L1 cam and CLU has been previously established, although in uh, colorectal cancers. And it also results in the increase in expression of MAPT, which codes for the um, tau protein. And we also looked at um, Pitt-Hopkins syndrome, um, which is uh, kind of uh, driven by a knockout in TCF4, and it's characterized by developmental delay, epileptic seizures, and distinct facial features. Um, knocking out TCF4 resulted in a decrease in FOXO3 expression in neural progenitor cells. And FOXO3 is a transcription factor that is key for neuronal survival. Um, it's been previously linked to TCF4 in the literature, um, as well as other diseases such as Huntington disease and aut autism. So finally, we wanted to look at our ability to engineer the teratoma with molecular circuits. Um, and the way these circuits worked was that um, <laughs> essentially there would be these mRNA binding sites um, engineered um, on these circuits. And when the and when specific mRNAs were present, they were able to silence um, silence this HSV for uh, TK circuit. Um, and what that did was essentially um, by giving the uh, teratomas, by injecting the teratomas um, and the mice with gancycovir, um, Without the binding of this mRNA, um, this HSV TK would phosphorylate the glancyclovir um, and result in DNA toxicity and cell death. So only cells that are expressing this endogenous mRNA should be able to survive. Although as, as we'll see, it's not quite as clean, but we do get the overall idea. So the idea is that a heterogeneous teratoma um, could be um, engineered to kind of only um, to exp to kind of contain more of a specific lineage. And there are a couple of reasons why we want to do this. Um, I know previously we were talking about one of the advantages of the teratoma is that it's kind of multi-lineage, but the teratoma is essentially growing exponentially. Um, and we're, we can only really grow it out to eight to 10 weeks in order to um, kind of make sure the mouse isn't in too much um, pain. Um, so one of the things we can do with this microRNA circuit now is because it limits the size of the teratoma and pushes the um, teratoma towards a specific lineage is we can try and mature the cell types from that lineage. Um, and these are studies that I think are ongoing in um, Prashant's group right now. But for the, our first kind of example, um, so here we see the, um, the effect of gancyclovir on teratoma size, we can see that the teratomas with gancyclovir again are much smaller and they essentially stop growing after a certain point. Um, 
And this MIR-124 uh, circuit, so MIR-124 is a, a neuroectoderm um, specific microRNA, was able to enrich for um, early neurons and to some extent neuronal progenitors. And there are two different injection methods here. So one is intratumoral and one is intraperitoneal and intratumoral. Um, and obviously the dual injection method um, produced uh, a much greater effect. So we also validated that um, our GCV plus teratomas did indeed have more neuroectoderm with immunostaining. So here we're showing immunostaining of PAC6, um, which is a key neuro neurodevelopmental um, marker gene. Um, we can see in the GCV plus teratomas, there's much more PAC6 than in the GCV minus. Um, and Similarly, um, we, we used RNA fish to validate the expression of HES5 um, in GCV plus and GCV minus teratomas. We can see looking at these whole kind of um, whole teratoma sections that there's much more um, HES5 expression when we add GCV and kind of enrich for neuroectoderm. So overall, um, we were able to identify um, uh, 20, roughly 20 cell types in the teratoma across all three human germ layers. We benchmarked teratoma heterogeneity and similarity to developing human cell types. We demonstrated the multi-lineage effects of key regulators such as RUNX1 using a CRISPR knockout screen in teratomas. <coughs> Sorry. We demonstrated the ability to, <clears throat> to model single gene diseases with teratomas, and we de demonstrated the ability to engineer teratomas towards a specific lineage, um, kind of towards the the application for further maturing these cell types. Um, and as a kind of um, example, using organoids or, or other types of 3D models would have required different types of organoids and, and multiple experiments in order to see the same effects that we were able to see. Um, and the teratoma, again, is also vascularized. So it has the potential, theoretically, to kind of achieve this, this type of maturity and size. So the um, publication um, and kind of all the analysis um, are listed here. And um, so these are all the people that are working on the project. And Sammy is um, a grad student who is also co-advised with um, Kun and Prashant, who's kind of furthering um, this teratoma work and looking at uh, time series trajectories of teratoma development and how those stack up with um, human fetal uh, development. So happy to take any questions. Any questions for Dr. Wu? Um, so in the paper, I kind of saw like two different mouse models mentioned. Uh, in the method, it was NSG mice, but uh, in the text, it, it was uh, RAC2 knockout and IR, uh, IL. Uh, IL to our to our gamma knockout. Do you know which um, one it was used? Yeah, yeah. I think I think it should be a uh, not skin mice. Um, NSG mice. NSG mice. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, do you know when when uh, injection was done? Was it like the iPS cells were single cells or their clusters? Uh, so they were um they were a single cell slurry in Matrigel. So it was sort of um one-to-one -one mixture of um, single cell iPSCs um, in Matrigel. Okay. Um, I don't know if you are uh, logged in early enough to uh, see most of Dr. Wan's talk. So he analyzed the uh, brain organoids um, at different days of differentiation, correlating to different fetal developmental stage. What do you think of teratoma at week 10 when you have to take them out? Where does it correlate to the fetal developmental stage? Yeah, yeah. So that's a question. Um, I think it's back here somewhere. Uh, so it really depends on the cell type. And we really only focused on the gut and um, neuroectoderm there. But um, yeah, so the uh, teratoma uh, neuroectoderm cell types correlate best to week 13 through um, week 17. Um, fetal brains. Although again, these this fetal brain data set um, at, at the time we we kind of um, did this study, um, there wasn't a lot of human fetal brain data out there um, for for kind of I think obvious reasons. And 
Um, I think with a higher resolution uh, fetal reference data set, we can maybe improve this a bit. But overall, it's week 13 to week 17 in, in terms of neuroactiverm cell types. But the gut cell types seem actually less mature. Um, so they, they map to the eight-week um, fetal gut. And when you uh, directed more towards like neuronal types, did you get further? Uh, yes, that's, uh, I'm, that's a great question. We haven't actually looked at that yet. Um, I think there are a couple of grad students in Prashant's group looking at that right now and, and kind of testing out um, different microRNAs um, to push towards different lineages. All right, last chance for questions. Have you compared the iPSC derived cell type and uh, teratoma derived cell types? The iPSC, so iPSC you, directly uh, like uh, a two D differentiation. Yeah. Um, no, no, we haven't compared it to a direct differentiation, like like with a direct neuronal differentiation. Although, the, yeah, that that'd be an interesting comparison as well. There's a question in the back. Hi, um, I have a question about the sort of um, sculpting. I think you maybe Xiaoja kind of alluded to this, but um, when you push towards the neuroectoderm, like how did that change maturity in terms of, um, or, or did you look at that closely? Yeah, yeah. So um, we we didn't look at that closely. Um, we were still we still took these teratomas out at ten weeks because. Um, that was that was sort of the uh, in the iCook protocol, um, but I think right now there's um, ongoing effort to kind of put, use these um, circuits, these sculpting, to try and um, mature teratomas past ten weeks now because again they're not growing at the same rate um, and the growth sort of plateaus. But we we weren't able to um, to kind of grow them past ten weeks, um, unfortunately. But yes, that'd be yeah. That's a great question. I, I think it'd be really interesting to to look into that more. All right, let's thank Dr. Wu again for um, especially stepping up to give the presentation at the last minute. Um, all right. Thank you. Um, so this is the end of the symposium. I hope you guys enjoyed the great talks as much as I did in the past two days. And I want to thank all the speakers for a fantastic job. Uh, I also want to thank you all to be here or over the Zoom. Um, I want to thank again for our sponsors, uh, Stem Cell Technology, Biotechnique Brands, Thermo Fisher and Millipore Sigma, uh, and Vijay Z, Debbie, uh, Lauren and Christine um, for all they, they did for the, for the symposium. Again, the, some of the recorded talks will be on our website shortly. Um, finally, happy holidays, everyone. Stay safe and healthy. We will see you next time.
Surge of this year. The way I understand. 